Can you say on behalf of the family how grateful we are for your presence today and for all of your uh, acts of kindness over the last few days and what an encouragement that's been to, uh, to these folks. It's a blessing to all of us. We come today to uh, remember the life of Lewis Harrison and uh, we're going to celebrate his life. Uh, we believe that God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, has taken our dear brother to himself and uh, he walks the streets of gold and before the crystal sea and beholds the face of God and there's great rejoicing in that and so we want to rejoice. As a result, we're going to sing, uh, we'll sing a couple of congregational pieces uh, and then our own Jen Davis, I want to introduce her uh, as she comes in a few moments, she, she'll be singing for us and then David Turner uh, as well will be singing. Um, also, David Sanders is uh, a former pastor here uh, at Mount Calvary, presently at New Harmony Church in Alkaloo, South Carolina. And we have him back to help us celebrate Lewis's life as well. But we do welcome you in Jesus' name. We read in Psalm 116 wonderful words that call us to uh, our time here. Here the Lord focus us upon himself and on his grace. As well, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now, in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant and the son of your maidservant. And you have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come in his merits. We come in his intercession. We ask that you would show your power in our midst, that you would pour out your spirit, that you would manifest the power of your word and bring comfort and bind us up. We praise you for the blessed hope and for this opportunity to celebrate the full consummation of the life and the salvation of Lewis Harrison. Would you give us grace and strength now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing to the glory of God, blessed assurance, if you'll stand with me.
Please be seated. We just sang about is Lewis's story, is Lewis's song. Nancy, thank you, not only for allowing me to play a role in this, but for your love and for your husband's love and your care for me and your ministry to me. Um, Holly and Kathy, thank you for this honor and privilege. Mary Jo as well. Um, thank y'all all for um, giving me this opportunity, family. And, I, and my heart is heavy with you, um, but there is much to be um, to be happy about, to celebrate. And that's what, I already hear Lewis tell me to shut up if I say anything about him. I'm already hearing it. Shut up, David, don't say anything about me. He talked to me several times about how he wanted his funeral to look, and I'm gonna try to honor that as much as I can. And if I mess up, I apologize in heaven. I'm gonna see him. Um, but it's an honor to be up here. Thank you so much. I, I got three messages that I saved. I'm not doing this for emotional reasons, but I'm doing this for, for you to hear it and be reminded of the great loss and the, reminded of, of, of what blessing he was. You know, as we grieve what God has taken, boy, it is evident, not just in your presence here today, which means so much to the family, but it's evident to us. Um, it's evident to us that he gave us much. And that's why it hurts. That's why there's a hole, Nancy, in your heart that you said to me. And, and there's a hole in our heart, a different than yours, but there's a hole in our heart um, as well. This is a message he left me years ago. Y'all might want to turn up a little bit here. I'm, I'm going to play it. David Lewis, just called to check on Red. Just uh, he's in our prayers every day. Uh, just wanted to check on him and see how he's coming along. Short to the point. David Lewis. No, just checking on you. Calling to see how Rep is still doing okay and also Rep and Manager. Oh, so, uh, just give me a call when you can. No, no rush. Just keep them, keep them in our prayers and hope you all doing okay. Thank you now. One more. David Lewis just wanted to congratulate you and Linda on your anniversary today. We are so glad you, uh, uh, the good Lord put you two together, and especially David, he put you up here. Congratulations. I'm sure you've had calls like that. I was glad I didn't pick up that time. Usually, hello, <laughs> when Lewis called me, not out of obligation, but out of the fact that, that he ministered to me. Um, you know, again, I hear Lewis tell me to shut up, but I, I want to say these things because this is going to point to why he was this way. But Lewis was a giver. In my relationship, he was a giver, not a taker. And I, you might would vouch with me in that. He, he was a giver. There's a lot of di different ones of us that, Sometimes we were more takers than givers, and he was a giver. And in my interaction with him, he, he um, always was generous with his focus, his attention. My wife, I said, Linda, tell me something about Lewis. And oh, right as I was you know, getting finished my sentence, she's always oh, big blue eyes and his big grin when he would greet you. And um, he, he was that way with many of us, right? Um, again, he would not want me to put him on a pedestal, but what we love so much about Lewis was how he related to us, how he cared for us. And there was, in, in my relationship, no strings attached. No strings attached to his generosity and to his gifts and to his, his prayers. And um, one of the reasons why I found myself going back to him so much um, in the, the 13 years that I knew him, especially in the last years, um, was because he ministered to me. And, and that's rare for a pastor to, you know, you get paid to minister to people. And they want to see you minister to people, and I understand that, and we should. We should do that. Um, but it's a blessing to a pastor, and I'm sure Richard would attest to the same thing, that, that he ministered to us. And Nancy, you were with him. I, I remember my first memories here at Mount Calvary 12, 13 years ago, and 
the thing that impressed me so much with, with them was I knew that they were loved by the church. I knew they were respected by the church. But when we had a covered dish, Nancy Lewis would be serving ice, doing a menial task, you know. And, 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 and um, when they could say, well, somebody younger can do it, you know, at the time. And they, and they instead would serve. And, and I miss seeing that as, as he became more limited. Um, but it was a blessing to me. He was a giver. He gave of himself. He gave of his resources. And he gave of his prayers, which was such a blessing to me. Two of the messages that I, one I didn't play. And I don't, I don't save a lot of messages, but I save Lewis's. And um, he, he said to my wife, you know, I'm praying for your dad, Rhett. And I'm praying for your um, Linda's dad, um, Mr. Minninger. And that's a hard name to say down here in the South. Minninger, um, try it. Um, and I was used to say it wrong all the time to tease Linda. But the fact that he knew how to say her dad's name meant that man's praying for him and was familiar with his names and took, took personal um, work to, to know who he was praying for. And those were all ministries to us. And he loved me. And I feel like with Lewis, what I witnessed, that he, whoever was in front of him was who he was going to love. Whoever was right before him, he was going to love. And I don't know if you've ever asked the question, well, why was he this way? You know, why, why did Lewis, why was he a giver? And why did he love so well? And he would want me to tell you why. In fact, he said, um, well, we, we know it's because he belonged to Christ Jesus as his Lord and Savior, that Jesus um, purchased him with his blood. Um, I would always say, how you doing, Lewis? And he smiled at me. He said, better than I deserve. Better than I deserve. He understood his sinfulness. And some of you have known Lewis longer, and you know more of his sin than I do. And you know some of his struggles throughout his life. But he knew that. He knew he was a sinner. And he knew he needed a Savior. And he put his trust in Jesus Christ. It was said in the obituary, I thought it was so beautifully written. He said that his greatest desire, we word, word for word, he said, um, He said, Lewis had a very devoted love for Jesus, and his greatest, his greatest desire is that everyone who reads this obituary would also know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, so that we can all be united together in heaven eternally. Kathy texted me, Richard, and she said, I'm not trying to get in your way, but just want to be sure you know uh, we want this to be a celebration of Dad's homecoming, homecoming, homegoing. While we certainly feel the pain of his loss, of his presence, we would like his service to be a joyful one in his desire to, to um, and it was his desire for us to lay it on you when it comes to the gospel. Y'all, you understand how rare that is? I've been rebuked by people when I've spoken the gospels at funerals. Well, you should talk more about the person. I've been rebuked as a pastor who's preaching the only hope in life and death, which is Jesus Christ. And I or at a wedding, Lewis felt that the best two places for the gospel to go forth was, a, was at a wedding and was at a funeral. And I don't know if you feel that way, but I love that he did. And you think about it, you say, why a wedding? That's about the bride and that's about the groom and that's about the family and all this. Jesus, God himself created marriage and he did it as a picture of his relationship with us. Why would we not speak of the gospel there? And in a funeral, it makes perfect sense. Why would, as we who are left at home, left here alone, home, left down here on earth, not at home, and we're left in our grief, the only hope for you is to hear the gospel that he trusted in, in Jesus Christ. I'm sad. I don't have a hold as big as Nancy or Mary Jo or his daughters or the grandkids or the nieces and nephews. But I'm sad I lost a prayer warrior. Many of us did. Many of us lost a prayer warrior. Let me tell you something. Lewis Harrison is not sad. He is, he is seeing Jesus face to face. He knows what our Savior looks like. And don't think our pictures have him right that you see on TV and stuff. He is smiling at his Savior and he is worshiping him in a way that he's never worshiped him before with 100% purity. No critical heart. No what's in it for me. He is consumed with Christ. And you know what? He's with my daddy who he prayed for. He's with Rhett in Virginia. And many of the others. This funeral would be a lot bigger if he had died 15 years early. Jim would tell me. Waited a little too long. 
which we're glad. There have been some big people here who knew Lewis and missed it. A lot of them have gone on. Some of them have gone on to be with Jesus. But he is so happy and so blessed. And he has seen what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Where they got a glimpse of Jesus' glory. He's seeing it in a way we have yet to see. And he is saying, I, I love that song, when we all get to heaven. I don't think everybody goes to heaven. Because the Bible's clear, everybody can go to heaven. But all believers, when we all who believe in Jesus... Go to heaven. What a glorious, what a, when we all get to heaven, what a wonderful, what was the word? What a wonderful, I was singing about back. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Thank you for the help. That's what he's doing, and, and we're missing out a little bit. And we ought to be happy for him and celebrate him. Not, Lewis is not up there worshiping Jesus because he's better than anybody. He's not up in heaven because he, did, he lived a perfect life. Some of us can speak to his failures. His family can speak to some of his failures. They got to see sides of him I never got to see. But he is in heaven because he has placed his trust in Jesus Christ. Now, he told me to be short. I've already probably gone too long. Okay, so let me just... Let me encourage you with God's word, and I'll turn it over to more singing. John, John, the Gospel of John. Let me tell you, one of the things I grieve when I lose a loved one like, like a family member or Lewis, I grieve I can't do anything for him anymore. I get, and I think you'll feel that as a caregiver, and you, those who care give for him. Mary Jo, you took little nice little things over to feed him, and Nancy, all the caregiving you did in the latter years. You, you miss doing stuff for them. You miss serving them. You miss caring for them. You miss, you miss helping them in vulnerable moments. I'll tell you what, someone means something to him. If you, if you want to love Lewis, you know what would mean a lot to him is read the Gospel of John. Make that a priority this, this week and, and this month. John says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John's saying there's things that Jesus did we didn't even write about. Lewis is learning about some of those things. He says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that whole book of John, he's saying, I wrote this so you can know who Jesus is, and you can have eternal life in Jesus. You can see your sin. You can see your need for a Savior. You can see how the, the God became, became flesh and dwelt among us. Read the Gospel of John and pray as you enter into it. Say, Lord, help me open my eyes to the Gospel of Jesus as you did Lewis's. Do with me, if he hasn't already, some of you can already test he's done it, but if he hasn't, if you're lost and you don't have any hope eternally, say, do with me what you did with Lewis. John also moved by the Holy Spirit writes 1 John. He says, these things I have written to you, again, he's kind of repeating, I wrote you so that you may know the Gospel, you may believe in Christ. He says, think, in 1 John, this is another good book to read, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He's saying, I wrote the things in 1 John to give you assurance. We're, gonna, we're just saying blessed assurance. He said, I wrote you these things to show you can know that you have eternal life. I wrote these things so you can know Jesus. I wrote these things so you can know you have eternal life. Now here it is. Listen to this. He gives us three things in chapter 2 in 1 John of how you can know you're saved. you got to know the gospel. Lewis knew the gospel. He knew his sin. He knew his need for Christ. And he put his trust in Christ. And he says, when I, when I get to heaven, I can't do anything to earn my way to heaven. But Jesus paid the price for my sins. He died and he rose again. That's the first thing. John says that. First John says you must. Anybody who says Jesus is not the Christ, he's, he's an antichrist. The second thing is that we care what God has to say. Lewis cared what God had to say. We care about his commandments. They mean something to us. Now, he, John also says if anybody says they're without sin, they're a liar. So he's not saying we're going to perfectly obey the commands, but we care what God has to say. It, it trumps any of our selfish desires. And the third thing, and this is what I saw in Lewis's life so much, and I'll be quick. The third thing he says is that you'll see the love of Christ spill over to others. I stand up here with great assurance that Lewis Harrison knew Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he is a blessing to me, and I will one day be with him because of Christ's mighty work in me. 
Not because I deserve it any more than anybody else up there in heaven, but because he loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for his sins. And if you knew Lewis, you saw the power at work of the gospel in his life. You saw the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. And that's who he wants me to spend most of my time talking to you about. So, he, so I don't have to worry about him seeing him up in heaven. He said, good job. His greatest desire for his family, his greatest desire for his friends, is that Jesus Christ will be Lord of your life so that he can spend eternity with you in heaven. That is what the Bible teaches. That is what the Bible proclaims. So many people read the Bible and they don't get that. They think, i got to make God love me. i got to work my way to make him love me more. But the gospel is in the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit can open your eyes to it if you ask him to. And my prayer is that you would. And we'll get to see Lewis again if you, return, if you, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, which would bring him great joy. I love Lewis Harrison. I'm going to miss him. I, I don't know who's going to pick up his slack for praying for me, but I know you were praying too. And um, I'll pick up my slack praying for others as well. So thank you so much. I'm sorry if I went a little too long. <laughs> much for what you bless us with in regards to Lewis Harrison. We thank you for the many years you gave him and the years that you allowed us to be a part of his life. Father, we thank you most of all for loving him so much that you would, you would send your son Jesus to die for his sins. And we thank you for you opening his eyes to the truth of the gospel through the Holy Spirit and moving him to salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Father, we pray for this family it leaves a big hole in this family, and the, the bigness of the hole is, is related 
to how great the gift has been that you've given to them. And may they think much with a smile on their face of how wonderfully gracious you've been to them. And I pray that your hand would be upon Nancy in her grief. Lord, that you would, you would um, as that prophet Isaiah says, that God, you are my husband, that you would be a husband to her. And that you would, would, would give her a peace that surpasses understanding. And Lord, that you would blow her away with, with, with how you would use such a painful thing in, in opening her eyes more and more to the wonderful greatness of you and who you are. Lord, I pray for Holly and Kathy and their families. And I pray that your hand would be upon them. I pray for all the grandchildren and the nieces and nephews and cousins. I pray for his little sister, Mary Jo, Christopher and Wendell. I pray, Father, they would know of your hand. I think of Psalm 139 about you, you knowing our anxious thought, you knowing our words before we speak them. I pray that they would know the interest that you're taking in them right now. And they too would speak of, of the mighty peace that you gave them in such a time of great grief. But Lord, let them mourn. Let it be sweet tears and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
peaches or strawberries or whatever the case would be. And I can remember talking to Lewis about it. He said, he said it's really no big deal. We had totem privileges. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what that meant, but, but it's all good. Um, those dinner on the grounds here where Lewis was filling cups with ice and tea and um, you'd be cleaning up at the end and Lewis would say, we got this, we're working the short rows now. Uh, I think he'd been in the peach business a little bit back in the day. Um, have any of you heard him use the phrase from Cairo to Cape Cod? <laughs> There's some dairy people there. Um, or being invited when a, a, a particular particularly wonderful dairy cow would come into the sale that he would say, gentlemen, you need to stand. We are in the presence of a lady. <laughs> um, I, David Turner and I were talking before the service, and I'm sure that um, David could go on forever, and I know we need to be careful of our time, but David might have told me a story before the service about them going to Valdosta, Georgia, and you know, you had to get there right as the milking was being done so that you could talk to the to the farmer or whatever. And so they left early in the morning and Lewis uh, had said, I need to speed up on this trip just a little bit. And David said we were running pretty hard at the time and straight stretch of road down in South Georgia with just some mild humps in the road and kind of opening things up and um, came over one of those humps and, and there was the highway patrolman and pulled him over and um, they were going so fast that they uh, the highway patrolman invited them back to the station <laughs> looked like David Turner was going to spend some time in jail unless he could post bond and he pounded the car the whole nine so um, uh, David Sanders spoke of sin in his life, so I guess I was <laughs> um, I often wonder about uh, my people, my church members, and um, I said this to Nancy earlier this week, what they were like as young people. And I asked Nancy, what, what do you think Lewis was like as a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old? And she said, just a force. Just never stopped. And uh, Mary Jo, I'm sure you could remember some pictures of early childhood and, and what was going on there. Um, can you imagine plowing a mule at six years old? Um, stories told of that actually taking place, being a, uh, a larger six-year-old there. Um, and he ministered in a lot of different ways, and in quiet ways, and in ways that not everybody saw. We rehearsed some of them. Um, all of us getting those phone calls on our birthdays uh, and those well wishes and hey I'm praying for you uh, Brian Cooper one of our ministers uh, one of our members mentioned that uh, he was he had worked in Iraq for two years and he never got phone calls in the middle of the desert his phone wouldn't pick it up unless he was in a certain location and he said all of a sudden his phone's ringing in the desert and it's Lewis wishing him happy birthday and that's just one of so many phone calls that I'm sure we could all uh, attest to. Um, Lewis was very much a part of uh, this church because the church is very much a part of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, we're part of the denomination that formed in 1973, and Lewis was a vital part of that. In fact, there's a, a document most churches have, our original charter of the Presbyterian Church in America, and Lewis's name is on it. And I'm so proud of that. And I, I, with great pride, said I have two, two people from our church who are uh, signatories on, the, on that document, uh, Tip Turner being the other one. And uh, Lewis is named there, but very much a part of our church and serving in so uh, many ways there. But Lewis had a life that would have been touched by the goodness of God. We could all see that. Um, but he never forgot that the goodness that he enjoyed flowed from the hand of God. Uh, he worked hard. He loved to work, clearly. But the Lord had blessed him, and he was grateful to the Lord for all that he did. Um, simple meals, 
I'm grateful for that. Nancy preparing a, a simple meal. I'm grateful for that and really being grateful for it. Um, and I want you to think about what uh, what he went through over the course of the last several years, health wise, and how he would feel. Um, over the course of his life, a couple of bypass surgeries in 2017, he had an aortic valve placed in his heart. And, um, you know, when your heart doesn't beat with all the efficiency that it should, you know, you get up and go, get something, and goes. Um, <clears throat> there was a melanoma that uh, we couldn't deal with uh, in the province of God. There was the Parkinson's uh, that was just. Uh, brutal, and I want you to think about how you would feel having those kinds of maladies going on in your body. But I'm telling you, you would never go and see Lewis without him saying, "We are so blessed." How many of you heard heard him say that over and over and over again? We are so blessed, and he he would say, "We," meaning me and and the rest of us. Um, we are so blessed. And he understood that what he had received was from uh, the hand of God. And of what a, a tremendous uh, example um, uh, to us all. My transition from this point to preaching the gospel was, in fact, that he said at every funeral and every wedding the gospel was to be preached. So I want to direct your attention to the word of God in keeping with what he would say. I will be brief, but I do want to focus us on the Lord Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, the Lord Jesus says, uh, he begins to deal with his disciples about um, eternal life. And he says, uh, the scripture says in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he spoke this word openly and then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him and when he turned around and he looked at his disciples he rebuked Peter saying get behind me Satan for you are not mindful of the things of God but the things of men I think about the Lord Jesus in this situation and what he does is is he brings to the disciples minds um, uh, the gospel and he tells them what is necessary, he tells them what is clear, and he tells them what is surprising. He said, I must suffer. The Lord Jesus would have to uh, go to Calvary's cross and would bear the wrath of God there. That's what he was suffering for, that God would exhaust his wrath upon uh, those for whom Christ would die. It was necessary. But it was also surprising. <clears throat> Peter was like, no, we're, we're going to fight this thing, and you're not going to ultimately die. And he says, that is a satanic thought. Peter, you don't get it. You, you are thinking like an earthly person, and you need to think like someone who um, is committed to the Lord and, co and connected to the Lord as well. And then Jesus goes on and he gives this contrast between a life that is lived in connection with Jesus and one that's not lived in connection with with Jesus. And these are powerful words. Hear them, please, with an open heart. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, the scripture reads, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And then listen to verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Last night, I was preparing thoughts and I was, I was working on a completely different message. And I woke up this morning and this verse was ringing in my ears. And I said, you know, many of us could look at Lewis and say, I, I want a life like that. If I could, if I could have what he has. Um, a governor called Nancy this week and sent his con condolences. So I, I would like to be connected like that. I'd like to know those people. I'd like to be, um, I'd like to be so successful. Um, 
And Lewis would tell you, as the Lord Jesus Christ tells you right now, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? And there's a rhetorical, it's a rhetorical question, but the answer is, is who would swap that? And many of us are saying, I wouldn't swap that. I wouldn't swap the whole world. And all of the gifts and all of the goodness all of the pleasant things that we enjoy here in this life, Lewis would. He did. And the Lord Jesus certainly would. And the Lord Jesus is communicating his love for us. Don't, don't be seduced by the world and all that the world is seeking to sell to you. We will all come to this day. We will all come to this day. We were talking before the service, Dave Turner and I, talking about how time just marches on, and we cannot stop it. We cannot slow it down. And we will all face a day of reckoning before our Maker. And here's Jesus saying, please be ready for it. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? He goes on, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Jesus is coming back. We know that Jesus died on a cross. We know he was in the tomb for three days, and we know he was resurrected, and now he's ascended to the right hand. But he's coming back. And that will be that day of great reckoning. What Lewis mentioned in that obituary, David, was that he wanted all of us to know the Savior. That all of us would be as rich as he was. Not in this world's wealth, but in the wealth that only the Lord Jesus can give. And so there is a question for us. What have you done with Jesus? What have you done with him? Have you said, no, I'm going after the things of the world. I'm going to trust in the things of the world. Or have we said, I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ? You know, if Lewis could come back, he would say all of this, all of this scripture is exactly true. That's what he would tell us. But we know that it's true simply because it's here in the Word of God. And I invite you, as this one reading and preaching the Word to you, for you to, to turn from your sins and to call upon Jesus, not to depend upon religion or your works, but to depend upon Christ. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny my own works. Deny my own ability to take myself to heaven. Did you realize that good people won't go to heaven? Good people don't go to heaven. It's people who realize their badness, just like Lewis did, and they run to Christ to say, save me. That's who goes to heaven. I, I didn't say that. That's what Jesus says. And the call of Christ is that we might come to him and be saved. Hope you will even this day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these glorious words. They're strong words coming from your son to us that we might in fact come to that moment where we have hope. Lord, help us to go from this place asking the question, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? And Father, I pray for my friends here today that if anyone doesn't know Jesus, oh, that they would call upon him in faith and repentance and be saved even this very day that they would have the hope, the certain hope of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with the Father. We pray it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing a favorite of Lewis's.
And that is when the roll is called God. You know, we can have a Wednesday noon stop on the organ. I want you to pull out the Saturday night stop. Let's open this up. Let's stand together. We'll sing to the glory of God when the roll is called God.